obviously technical difficulties as usual but uh today i'm going to cover just the basics uh and again this is by most definitely a basic introduction to the seasonal management of beehives um just kind of going to go over some of the 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 time things the timing of things and um the importance of the time timing of different activities that you're going to do within the hive um, once you get your bees and you know start start working your bees and start learning more about them you're going to learn there's little subtle nuances that the bees of um, and the environment are going to tell you um, that you'll pick up on that obviously none of us want to be here and i i don't know them all so um you know i am a i've had bees for six or seven six or so years now i guess but uh there's still a lot that i have to learn um a lot i have to learn on what you know the beekeeping itself the the forage everything so um like i said this is something that you'll pick up on and learn more about uh as you delve further into it um so but basically um the most important thing is just learning one of the more important things is learning the basic arrangement of the nest uh we've kind of talked about this a little bit prior to now in the equipment side of things um, when we talked a little bit about um, the what equipment you need to get started, uh, that sort of thing, those sorts of things. So we talked a little bit about the makeup of the hive as far as the bi you know it, during the biology of the bee presentation. So uh, just the learning about that arrangement and how the bees are um, reacting to the environment and the conditions and the forages. Um, this is all stuff that um, you'll learn as you go. Uh, there are books, and I've got a list of some resources at the end of this presentation uh, that are that will be handy and are handy to have um, either before you start getting into bees or as you begin with bees or even a lot of the experienced guys still um, use a lot of these resources um, or a couple of these resources. So. Um, being able to read the arrangement of the nest and the hive and being able to tell um, what is going on if the arrangement's different than it normally is, should be or is or uh, depending on the time of year. So basically within our hive, uh, this is a Langstroth of hive obviously, uh, but you're going to see the brood and the queen typically in the center of the hive towards the middle of the boxes kind of spread um, right in the heart of it. Um, and then up at, on, along the edges, you will see the honey and the pollen. Um, and then obviously the honey supers are up top uh, where the excess honey is, uh, is stored during a honey flow. Um, so just knowing that basic arrangement of where you should find certain things within the hive will give you a clue when you're, when you're managing your hives as to what could be going on and some things you may need to, um, to look into as far as what could be causing some issues. So uh, I know this is a graph that we've all, I've showed quite a few times over the course of the past few weeks during my beef um, presentations here. Um, should be pretty familiar, just that Darth uh, during the winter when the bee population is low, um, and that's shown by the red line and the population and then the honey flow or the availability of forages uh, for the bees represented by the sunflowers down at the bottom. Um, so you can see that, you know, that winter population just kind of hangs out. Uh, and then when things start to pick up in late March uh, or April, depending on the year and the climate, um, you know, the population increases greatly of, due to that availability of food. Uh, and then during the dark of the summer, um, basically, you see that population kind of lower down, um, drop back down, and then then you got your late summer um, population or um, growth in the in the early fall, late summer during that bloom or during that honey flow. So when we're thinking about what is driving this graph, you should say, or driving this growth, is basically the availability of food. Uh, so the queen is trying to get a jump start on her uh, population to where she has more workers available during the time of availability. Obviously, if that timing's wrong, having a 
60,000 workers in the hive and no food available is not the optimal uh, thing. So she has to get a little bit of a jump on it. Uh, so, and have that population ready at the height of it instead of at the very end or even prior to. So just the timing of either feeding to stimulate um, the brood rearing or, um, or if you just let the hive do its natural thing and you just, you know, you're not really concerned with gathering honey per se. Um, you're just looking for the pollination benefits, something like that, to where you're not going to be trying to harvest a lot of the excess honey, maybe just a little bit of it. But, um, you know, you're not in the business of producing honey. So, um, but basically their food source can, 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 contains two items, nectar and forage and pollen forage. Um, there are different plants, depending upon which one you're, they're looking for. Uh, some plants are nectar, some plants are mostly pollen, uh, and some are um, kind of a combination of both, uh, but some can be more heavily can be leaning more towards production of one more so than the other. Or there may be plants where the bees um, use one particular plant only for its pollen uh, and then another plant only for its nectar or um, any combination of that. So basically th with those two items, the nectar and the forage, which are, are the nectar and the pollen, um, the pollen is used, both of these items are used in um, brood rearing. Uh, so this is what they feed their young when it's in the larva stage right before it becomes a um a sealed cap like you can see here on the left side of that frame those sealed that's those sealed brood um they use a little bit of pollen and um the microflora from their gut to use along with the nectar or honey and they insert that and that's what they feed the larva uh during the growth stage long before it before it fully develops so um it's important that um, that they have good sources for both pollen and nectar. Um, nectar is typically used for their energy, um, and that's protein is used for, or the pollen is used as their protein source. So uh, kind of kind of our carbs versus our starches, or um, carbs versus sugars, that sort of thing. So. Um, or I guess not carbs and sugars, but um, basically our protein versus our carbs. So um, just one way to look at it. So you've got to balance those out. You can't have an overabundance of only energy and no protein. So um, they, they are some of the greatest uh, at balancing this diet and figuring out what it takes to exactly enough to put into that cell to where they, um, where the larva fully forms and becomes uh, a good good bee worker bee. Um, so the, some of the things you want to do is you want to start early in the season. Obviously, you don't want to start too early where there's still a chance of uh, cold temperatures and um, you know maybe even some uh, snow or a heavy heavy frost or freeze. Uh, you don't want to stimulate that production and then have the basically have the hive break its um the i can't think of the word i'm trying to think of uh break that uh, swarm it's not really a swarm but it's a a cluster um during the winter basically the bees will cluster up in the center towards the top of the hive to keep warm um so you don't want them to break that cluster um and then possibly have some cold damage or cold death due to due to the cold conditions. Um, so basically, just kind of depends on your geography and the climate where you're at. North Mississippi is going to be a little. You're going to want to start a little bit later than you are here in South Mississippi. Um, so typically, again, I know I've mentioned nucleus hives just a couple of times as well. Typically, that's when those will be available, usually around April, uh, sometimes even into May. But uh, if you can get them earlier, that's better. That gives you a better chance of getting them um, accustomed to their new, high, new home, um, get settled in, get transferred into your boxes, and then they're available and ready to go once, uh, once the flowers start blooming and the weeds start putting off pollen and 
um, all kind of good stuff. So the earlier the better, but not just too, too early. Um, again, like I said, basically that, um, that influx of food stimulates that queen. She keeps checks on the hive. Uh, she knows what's kind of coming in and out. And just that a vast incoming food productions will base or will basically stimulate her to, to start laying eggs. Uh, and then the worker bees will start towards brood production. Uh, once all that, once the pollen and the nectar starts coming in. So basically, as I mentioned earlier, that w w when we looked at the normal makeup of the hive, how the brood will be in the center of the nest uh, with the honey towards the top and the edges. Um, typically what has happened in earlier spring on the far, on the left, on the left picture here, left image, uh, this is kind of early spring what you want to, what you will see. Um, the brood nest will be towards the top of the hive um, just because of that warmth, uh, trying to stay up there where the heat rises, trying to keep warm uh, away from that entrance or that cold draft of the entrance at the bottom of the hive. So basically they have migrated somewhat from the bottom of the hive to the top over the course of the winter as the temperatures got colder and as they consume their resources of honey and pollen and nectar, um, they advance with it up towards the top of the nest. So basically what you want to do in early spring is come in uh, and a lot of people may only use one deep brood box and in that case you'll just want to add an empty one on to the top of it. But in this case if you've overwintered with two hive bodies uh, you want to go in there this time, of, or actually in the early spring, um, and, and rotate those boxes around to where the empty box is now on top instead of below where the majority of your bees and your brood nest and your honey are located. Um, this just, bees typically like to work up, so they'll usually start, um, they, if you leave them kind of in that left image, um, they really won't grow into the bottom boxes. It'll take them a little longer to realize that it's there. This way, um, the bees are just more accustomed to working towards the, towards the up direction. So uh, if you give them some empty space in there um, above them, they will grow into that and um, just makes it easier for them to find it. But um, basically the point of that is to give them more room. Um, they've basically, at, if you leave them on the one to the left where they're at the top of the hive, um, a lot of times they will think they're out, they've outgrown their home. So they will have a tendency to do this, which is called swarm as, um, as Christian mentioned prior to, um, prior to our meeting here when we were chatting, talking about how bees, a lot of beekeepers will come in uh, and they'll, they will be happy to get these uh, as more so as to doing cutouts where it actually comes in, have to do, you know, cut out a wall or something of your house. Uh, a lot of times that's just a lot of work and it can, you know, there is some liability there. And obviously a lot of factors go into, you know, whether someone feels comfortable coming into someone else's house and uh, trying to remove bees or cut them, do a cut out and try to save them. So um, that is a tough, tough situation to be in there. Um, but we're trying to prevent the swarming. So basically what a swarm has happened, um, the bees have outgrown their home is the typical reason. There are some other reasons, obviously. Uh, it's not the only one, um, but a vast majority of them are because they are either out, have outgrown their home or uh, just don't feel like their hive is uh, either safe or, you know, waterproof, something like that. So they're trying to, um, they're trying to grow. This is a way for them to, for them to, turn one hive into basically two. So by preventing swarming or ways to prevent swarming or like I just mentioned, reversing those hive bodies to where the empty ones are now on top, they have room to expand upwards. Uh, we can give them some added supers because a lot of times once they get cramped and uh, they have all their the cells stored either with brood or with a mixture of brood, pollen and honey, um, there's just no place for them to grow. So by adding supers, we give them an opportunity to take some of that honey out of where the brood nest should be um, 
and move it up towards the top of the hive where um, you know where it's kind of up out of the way, kind of like our attic. We can we can store stuff in our attic. Less stuff we the stuff we don't use quite as often, uh, it just gets it out of our way. Uh, we can do some splits or um, you know things like that where we turn one hive into two. We buy a new queen or raise a new queen. Um, take some of the worker bees and replace those frames that have eggs and brood, replace those with empty or already drawn comb to where that um, queen now has empty cells to where she can start laying eggs. Uh, so there's some ways we can manipulate, obviously, the amount of room in that, hi in that hive to where, um, where it kind of fools them into thinking they have more room than they actually do. Um, Again, the shake the nurse bees in front of a weaker colony, um, they'll feel like they, they, you know, they'll go into the, out of a good strong hive, they'll think that's still their home. They'll go in, start doing their job again. Um, and it, you know, shouldn't cause an issue. Uh, this can sometimes lead to robbing or, uh, you know, it can lead to some other issues, but a lot of, most of the times you're pretty safe by doing this. And then the checkerboarding is basically you're going in, taking out full frames and replacing them with um, empty frames to kind of like the um, what I mentioned earlier with the uh, splits. So we're basically just going to go in there, take out some of the full ones, uh, replace those with empty, kind of fool them into thinking they got a new new place to new place to raise some young or for store honey if you know if that's the case uh, you may not be have a full full honey super that's slam full but being able to take one or two frames that are full and uh, see it fully sealed and ready for harvest um, being able to unload those frames uh, makes a big difference so So honey production is the next thing. This is going to be late spring. Once the flowers and everything are starting to bloom, uh, you'll see that uh, that brood nest should have grown into both hive bodies, um, as opposed to just that little small fist size, um, you know, small small group of uh, a brood nest um, or area of brood nest, I should say, in the top of that of that box. So late spring, obviously this is the time we want to put a honey super on. Um, this is the time that a lot of our, most of our flowers are blooming. Um, you know, again, this is all kind of dictated by your climate zone and your area, uh, what's blooming around you, what wildflowers or what forage sources you have. Um, so obviously clover may, may bloom a little bit later than maple or, uh, some of our earlier blooming things. So just be mindful of what's your typical or what's your normal forage for the bees uh, and when is the majority of that blooming. Obviously, South Mississippi, we're, we've got quite a few things with some tallow, uh, privet, um, a lot of our rudbeckia species, um, coreopsis, a lot of wildflowers, a lot of clovers. So um, a, lot of, a lot of good food in the South Mississippi for them. Um, early summer, again, still, still right, right now, people are really starting to harvest their honey supers, uh, starting to pull honey. So, um, and a lot of people have done it over the past maybe four weeks or so. Um, it's really been our kind of our go-to time, I guess, a hot and heavy time for um, for pulling honey off of hives. Uh, so now, basically, you're just wanting to keep that honey on or you can pull it off it's still still doing its thing the, the, the hive is uh, maybe starting to consume a little bit of that honey uh, obviously we need to make sure we leave enough reserves uh, on to our on our hives for them to to supply themselves with food uh, over the dark of the summertime so you don't if you do pull all the honey you have to make sure you feed them um just again you're just going to want to have to manage them a little bit more so if you're taking their food so you're going to have to supply them with some pollen and some nectar for um for food sources for them to continue raising bees and keep that hive 
um, because those numbers will go down towards the middle of the summer as we saw in the graph earlier. So nectar is what's used for honey, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it is a um, solution of fructose, glucose, and some sucrose, not very much, but uh, they, um, bees are able to convert this using enzymes within their, um, within their gut. Um, Invertase is actually what they, uh, the enzyme is actually used. Um, and then they evaporate water that has um, the excess water. Uh, and once, typically once honey has reached about 17% moisture is when um, the honey has fully ripened and capped. Uh, the bees are able to, to know when, when that point is reached. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing actually. Uh, and they will seal it up with a, um, with the wax covering. So, um, our primary goal here is colony strength throughout the entire, basically the, throughout the lot, the year, yearly cycle of the bees. Um, so we need to make sure our winter bees, those are the ones that are the most important because those are the ones that are going to expand our hive come early spring. Um, so we need to make sure that they have plenty of either food resources available to them, that either honey or uh, we're feeding them or they have some type of way of surviving in the winter time, uh, either cold conditions or even through starvation happens a lot of times in the honey bee, um, in a honey, honey bee hive. Um, a lot of times just starvation, running out of food sources, uh, not able to get food because if, uh, it's the dead of winter and we've either gone in there in early fall and taken all of their food or we've neglected to feed them um, a good healthy diet through over the course of the winter once we harvested all of their resources. So also need a good queen. Uh, obviously without a good laying queen, um, it's going to be tough to to build up the numbers of those colonies or the number of individuals within that colony, I should say. It's very important that we have a good strong queen. A lot of people replace their queen every year, uh, some every two years, um, you know, just opening that, getting in there, realizing what's going on within the hive, noticing it, taking, taking cues or hints from the bees themselves. Um, we'll tell you, we'll kind of give you an overall picture of how, how, how the strength of the colony is doing. Um, and obviously controlled the Varroa mite. This is a new pest or relatively new pest um, for bees in, um, in the US. Um, we've had them for quite a few years now and they don't seem to be going anywhere. Um, this is a problem that many of the old beekeepers never really had to deal with up until the past few years and it can be very very detrimental to um to the strength and to the overall survivability of your hive so going unchecked or unmanaged varroa um will, can definitely increase your your odds of losing losing hives uh, we do have a few options for varroa mite control i'm not really going to delve deep into those um they're a little more complicated than uh, the time frame we're given here today, um, but uh, but we do have a couple of options. Some of them are just management options. Some of them are chemical options. Um, so you do have a kind of a wide variety of controls for that available. So um, and then consider a brood break with requeening. Uh, so basically, that's just kind of starting that hive over for the most part. Um, you know, you're just kind of having a brood break in there. That is one, one way of controlling Varroa mites because they are um, pests and they are generated within the cell with the pupa and the eggs and the larva. So, um, you know, if you can break that, give that time period of no brood, uh, you can kind of break that cycle of Varroa as well. So, um, in the spring, we're looking to basically eight to 10 frames of bees, five to four to five frames of brood of that 10, uh, and then about 15, 20 pounds of honey just to kind of get them going, uh, make sure they're, 
you know, they got the resources they need because again, that is between the honey and the pollen, that's what they're going to use for bee bread uh, to feed their young. So making sure those resources are available to them to build up that colony relatively quick is going to be super important. So without that, those resources, they're not going to be able to, um, to be able to do what they need to do. A um, couple of things to not do. Uh, don't feed too much. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we can plug that nest with honey or, or nectar or um, pollen, whatever it may be. Uh, we don't want to plug up that nest. We want to always give them some room and always have them something to do. Um, busy, you know, a, a busy bee is a good bee, is a healthy bee typically. Uh, once they start running out of room and don't have anywhere to do anywhere to go or to store resources, bees want to go out and work. They want to get out, go out and find as much as they can to bring back. So always having them a little bit of room um, is a good thing. Um, obviously, plugging the nest restricts the growth and uh, it increases the the susceptibility of that um, or the likelihood of that hive uh, wanting to swarm. And that's obviously not a good thing because once bees get the tendency to do it, they want to do it no matter what you do. Uh, so if we can never, you know, never have them even that have that thought enter their mind, we're a lot better off. Um, and we don't want to disturb the bees too often. Uh, now again, this is a problem that I see a lot with um, beginner beekeepers. I had the same problem myself. Uh, we just want to go out there as much as every opportunity possible, just go out there, open them up, make sure everything's still good. Um, you know, and I was doing this um, same like sometimes daily. Um, that's really not a great idea, just always being in there, um, disturbing them. And that's just, you know, kind of, it hinders them, it slows them down, it kind of takes their mind off of what they should be doing and kind of into survival mode. So it just, it'll, it'll definitely set them back. So limit your to once every two weeks or so during the times that they're actively growing the hive during the honey flows or prior, right prior to a honey flow. Uh, and limit your visits to no more than 20, 30 minutes. Um, you know, the more time that you're in there, the less time, the, and then probably the more damage you're doing in the hive as well that they were gonna need to repair, uh, whether it be the cells or combs or whatever it may be. Uh, just try to limit your um, the amount of time you're in there, um, and this is a kind of a, a way a lot of people think of beekeepers, or a lot of things that some categories of beekeepers, I guess you could say. Um, there's a beekeeper, and then there's a bee haver. Um, you know, so there it does take quite a bit of management. Uh, it's not like it used to be where you could just get a hive of bees, basically go out there, uh, set them out in your boxes or, you know, go back every two to three times a year, collect your honey and put the top back on them and um, be done with them. Uh, today, it, it actually takes a lot of management, again, with the varroa mites and some other uh, diseases, uh, fungus that we have that are problems. Um, you really got to be a beekeeper uh, these days, more so than a bee haver. So just go, know that going into it. Um, you want to always be constantly managing or constantly monitoring, not really managing. Uh, hopefully, you don't have to do a lot of managing. Hopefully, you're you know you're providing a solid base and um, providing a lot of um, you know resources for your bees to where they're as healthy as they can be. Uh, they've always got a food source available or uh, resources available for food. Um, so being able to constantly evaluate your honey production is um, is key, uh, really. I mean, that, that's, that's their food, so that's going to dictate everything uh, that that colony does is based off of food. So um, you want to make sure that you're getting a lot of honey production. This isn't necessarily a lot of honey gathering, uh, but you're wanting your, you know, this, the more honey that a colony is producing, typically the stronger that colony is. Uh, so you're not, again, this isn't 
honey gathering. This is honey production of your hive. So, um, and understand that you're going to lose some hives. Um, depending on the years, 25% can be a good year. Um, one out of four is pretty normal, but again, depending on weather conditions during the winter time, um, depending upon a lot of different factors. Um, you know, in the past, I've, I've lost up to 50 or 75% of my hives, uh, but that was basically due to my mismanagement uh, or my lack of management in general, not necessarily um, mismanagement, but lack of management. Um, so um, understanding that loss is going to be pretty, that, that loss is normal, um, is go ahead and let it sink in because it's going to happen. Don't let it be upset. Uh, figure out what went wrong. Um, do your best to kind of prevent it in the future. Um, see what you can do a little bit different to maybe get ahead of the problem. Um, and then also after this happens, obviously using um, a good strong hive to replace, or you can split a good strong hive uh, sometimes into two to three um, new colonies um, to make up for those losses. Um, so you don't necessarily have to, you know, if you start off with two hives and your first year and the first and one of them dies your first year and your the other one is doing extremely well, um, use that use that one that is doing extremely well to get back up to your two or your or increase to three hives. Um, you don't necessarily have to run off and buy you know spend the money on a brand new uh, nucleus or uh, package bees, whatever it may be. Um, you can use your own strengths to to kind of make up for your weaknesses there uh, a couple of resources that i mentioned to you obviously mississippi state extension we have a great apiculturist uh dr jeff harris he's our apiculture um specialist there in starful uh they do have their own little um site on the extension webpage. it's uh the agriculture slash livestock slash beekeeping uh, they have a lot of, he's done a great job of updating a lot of the new um, publications regarding related to beekeeping. Um, he's very nice and very easy to work with, uh, very, makes himself available to clients and to, um, you know, to the, to us um, as well, just to beekeepers as well as to extension, uh, extension agents, obviously. Um, but um, a lot of great resources in that website, obviously. Um, and then again, I can't harp on it enough. I think I've mentioned it about every time we've done one of these bee meetings is to, um, to get up with your local beekeeping clubs or your association, uh, talk with some local or current beekeepers, uh, get up with them, pick their brains, ask to see if you, know, if you could help them work with some bees or if you have bees already that you're having problems with they would be more than happy to uh, more than likely come out and take a look at your bees, let you work, help them work with their bees to learn more, what to look for, uh, what you're looking at. Uh, just, you know, there's a world of information um, in our local bee club. So um, again, you know, depending on your location, obviously the Palm Belt Bee Club um, may be of interest to you, to, you know, I don't know. We meet the first Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. in Purvis. Um, but the Mississippi Beekeepers Association also has a website, mshoneybee.org. Um, they have a list of local associations and local affiliates that, um, and they have their meeting times as well as their locations on their website. So um, another great resource that I apologize I over did not put on here. Um, and then um, the Beekeeper's Handbook. This is a great publication or a great resource. Uh, this was one that I used very, very frequently when I began. Uh, it kind of walks you through from start to finish um, or and a lot of the more detailed um, newer things that um, this is the fourth edition, so it has been updated recently. I uh, put the ISBN number there, it can be not a super expensive book, but it can be thirty, forty dollars. Uh, but it is a great resource and um, a lot of good information in there. So 
that's really about all I've got for today. I think I saw there may 